All right, guys, uh, welcome to another episode of uh, Tradecraft Tuesday. This week is, a, is an awesome week that we're actually going to go over all the tradecraft used by good old Phineas uh, Fisher. That's the yeah. hacker uh, that, that actually gained access to the tradecraft, uh, excuse me, the hacking team network. Hacking team. Yep. Yeah, so uh, yeah, it's good to be back. I mean, we were gone for uh, two weeks. We had a lot of stuff to do. Um, thank you, Phineas Fisher, for posting this and giving us great content, I guess. Yeah, uh, yeah. Not every day that you kind of just get like, hey, here's my hacker manifesto. Here's the step-by-step right. -step OPSEC savvy tradecraft that I used or the techniques I used. And what's kind of sad is it kind of reminded me of every pitch or every presentation I've ever heard that says, you know, these are the internal controls that you need to have in place to prevent this type of thing. Yeah. So it's kind of great validation on, uh, you know, on why understanding this offensive tradecraft is important from a defensive perspective. So... Right. Uh, like every week, I, I kind of jump right over. I'm Kyle Hansloven. This is Chris Bisnett, and we usually start out with some news. So uh, one of the things that hit close to home, I saw a local Baltimore hospital got hit with some malware this week. Chris, you know anything about that? Yeah, it's pretty bad. It was uh, Baltimore Union Memorial Hospital. Um, they were infected through, I guess, their parent company, which is MedStar. Um, so uh, it's continuing the trend of, of hospitals getting popped with ran ransomware. Um, I guess they're just an easy target because of the likelihood that they'll pay the ransom. Um, I mean, that's pretty, that's, that's pretty jerk move, yeah. you know, but, uh, you know, I mean, we always knew malware authors weren't like, you know, real humans anyway. Are you, hey, I, you know, I take it. <laughs> All right. Maybe that's too much. All right. On top of that, what's funny is I just actually got out of a meeting earlier where somebody was telling me about doing incident response on an embedded, uh, you know, firmware maker, excuse me, embedded hardware maker uh, handset yeah. out of China. Mm -hmm. And right, uh, you know, it showed up that, hey, some of these cheap embedded devices could be pre-pwned. So it's kind oh, of my. that uh, these two things happened at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. So this one was pretty interesting. I saw this one. Um, I think this one was on Hack News. Um, so some guy basically, it's a real short post, but he basically said, you know, his friend asked him to help him set up a security system. He went on Amazon. There were these cameras. They're like, you know, 1080p HD, like security cameras that you put like on the side of your house or like wherever. And so he ordered them, um, you know, and he, when he was setting them up, he was like, wait, why didn't the video feed come up right? Like what's going on here? And so he did like view source and there was like some random URL in there. And, you know, when he looked it up, it was basically like, yeah, it's totally pwned. So brand new devices, never connected to the internet, came pre-pwned. Uh, what are you going to do? Uh, yeah, I, I, see crazy. That. I think of the little, uh, you know, the Intel inside logo, like malware inside. Yeah. That's yeah, kind that's, of, yeah. yeah, they should all ship with that. <laughs> Can we make that as a sticker and give that out of swag? Yeah, that seems like a, a decent idea. Um, and then, uh, you know, we've talked about, you know, good old ransomware over and over. And it looks like the, uh, what is it, the Petya malware or pe uh, Petya... Uh, ransomware was actually cracked this week. Pretty easy to uh, yeah. So I think this actually, I think this actually happened. Was this last week or something? I, I, you can take a look at the GitHub. Um, we'll post a link to it. Uh, but basically, what happened is uh, it, it was a pretty interesting story. This this guy he goes over to his um, uh, father in law's house for for Easter, and you know the first thing the guy says to him is like, "Oh my gosh, this guy sent me his resume," and uh, I. I really needed to look at it and I opened it and then, you know, it asked me for the admin password and I entered the admin password and now I just get this red skull. And so basically, basically what happened is like he enabled like macros and like it asked for the admin password and he just gave it to it. And then, so his whole hard drive was encrypted. Um, but where the story gets actually really cool is this guy was like, okay, fine. So he like took it and he found that um, uh, the pet malware actually uses um, like a really terrible version of, of Salsa to do encryption. It's, it's not even like Salsa 20, which is like the minimum. It's like Salsa 10, but it was like some homegrown stuff and it was terrible. So he was able to write um, using Go. He, he wrote some uh, basically a genetic algorithm to solve it. So um, basically the, the algorithm runs and there's a fitness function. So it checks like, is this closer to the real key? Or is this further away from the real key based on how many bits of the key match and how the decryption works? And then uh, so it runs, it tries a bunch of different things, and then it finds one that works and whole hard drives decrypted just like that. So um, if you've been hit by Petya or you know anybody else who's been hit by Petya, go check it out. 
Um, he said he finds the key for like for his father-in-law's malware in a couple seconds, I think. So nice. And I already posted in the in the uh, chat here for anybody that's actually tuning in on Blab that here's the link to the GitHub uh, you know article that I'll actually walk through and actually root this uh, pet you key for you. But but, yeah. uh, but enough with the news. Enough with the news. We, we're here for Phineas Fisher and the hacking team uh, Tradecraft. So uh, for folks that aren't familiar. Um, Phineas Fisher is undeniably not this guy's legitimate name. It's just a hacker moniker handle. Um, and the reason that it's important about this guy is he actually previously pwned uh, Gamma Group, who uh, ironically, their, their software, FinFisher, was well known for kind of uh, a commercial CNE capability, a commercial right. spyware hacking capability to gather data for yeah. law enforcement purposes. So. Right. Uh, this is not his first company he's hacked and publicly shamed. Um, what's interesting about this is this is the first time that he did an English post, and it translates at least a little bit better than his previous Spanish posts. Uh, so we're going to jump right into that. If you guys haven't seen it, um, you can follow along. I'm throwing the paste bin article right now. I already put it in there. Now it's in there twice. That's now good. it's in here twice. Sweet. So there's a, a good old uh, you know, link to Phineas Fisher's uh, English article. And the reason this is so darn exciting is uh, it's not very often do you get somebody who's bold, daring enough uh, to actually mm -hmm. say, like, hey, this is how I compromised uh, the system step by step. And there's a lot we can pull away from this, even from a defensive per uh, perspective, on exactly what are the you know mechanisms that could have stopped this. You know, at the same time, I think a lot of penetration testers are going to be you know arguing like. Duh, I can't, you know, of course this stuff works. This is the same techniques we've used on countless, you know, engagements for the last five years. Uh, special about this. And so we'll, we'll do a good job today on like kind of hashing out. Here is just traditional tradecraft. Here is maybe yeah. some extra sophistication that Phineas Fisher, you know, brings to this. So um, should we get into um, who is hacking team and, and why is this? Yeah. Why did you after them? Yeah, so uh, we mentioned Finn Fisher, uh, you know, that was the, the Gamma Group uh, attacked, you know, this company that actually put out their uh, software, Finn Fisher. Uh, hacking Team was an Italian company that provided essentially RCS, um, and that, that's their uh, intelligence gathering platform, malware in a box, you can pay for it, use it technically for, you know, uh, legitimate collection, um, could also be used for spying, etc. Right, right. Yeah, I think a lot of the a lot of the people that really took issue with hacking team was about um, the capabilities that they had and who they were selling them to. Um, you know, a lot of people are probably okay with selling some of these capabilities to um, you know some nation states, but then there are a lot of other nation states who are just rampant with um, I don't even know what the what, what's the term I'm looking for here, like uh, human rights violations and stuff. You know, like genocide, like just terrible things, like. These are not the people who should be having access to tools to enable them to do what they're doing, like the evil atrocities they're committing, and to be doing it faster, better, easier. So yeah. that's where a lot most people, I think, took issue with it. Is uh, you know, it, it's one thing to sell to like a UK or the US or you know any you know any of the more upstanding countries, but when you're selling to people like Syria and uh, Saudi Arabia, not not awesome. Ah, uh, who knows? I mean, I, I think people, uh, you know, ask the question, really, is it ever okay? I think that's kind of the point about this is uh, obviously Phineas Fisher said it's not okay. It's not okay for anybody to be doing spying. So he kind of took, uh, you know, it into his own hands, internet vigilante style, and decided to, you know, if they're going to sell it to some people, everybody should be aware of it. Everybody should be able to see what their samples looks like all the way down to their source code. So, um yeah. Now, I appreciate that that comment here of just saying, hey, really, is that okay? Because, yeah, that, that's a valid question. Um, what's interesting about Phineas Fisher, he jumps right into his uh, pacement article saying, you know what, OPSEC is important. And I think that's really interesting because a lot of the people who get compromised, if we remember some of the LULSEC and on, you know, anonymous type compromises, um, you really have to, you know, maybe invest more in your actual OPSEC than the actual operation that you're conducting. I mean, Let's not sugarcoat this. He conducted a surgical operation where he gained access to this company's network, you know, targeted specific users to get the access he needed to be able to collect the information he came for. So although, you know, it's in no way, shape or form a military operation, it appears to be executed with the, you know, the surgical, I don't know, techniques 
surgical, you know, effort um, the, the, that you would see out of a military group or something like that, a state sponsored group. So I thought it was really interesting that he jumped right into that. And it appeared that he was, you know, um, quite savvy. He said, not only should you use Tor, you should not directly connect to Tor. And I found that really interesting, you know, him understanding the importance of controlling your redirectors and your ability to route traffic to the Tor network. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, he really had like two big takeaways from it. And like one was like encrypt your hard drive. So if something does happen, the police show up at your house, your hard your hard drive is encrypted, right? Like they're they're gonna have to get you to give them the key, and and then that's a whole nother thing, right? Um, and then yeah, like you said, the other thing was really just use Tor. Like so, he he recommended don't just use Tor browser bundle. So that's where a lot of the um, uh, the lulsec guys really went wrong is they they really just use the Tor browser bundle, which is like Firefox that routes through Tor, right? But um, you know, there was, uh, the Gruck did a, a really interesting, um, talk a while back where he basically showed like, oops, forgot to turn on tour when I made that little sec post, you know, and it's like only takes one time, one time and you're done. Right. So, so what he was arguing is don't just use a browser, bill. completely separate your personal from your professional, from your hacking. I don't know. So he was saying basically just use a VM and do everything in that VM and have that VM routed through tour so that. You know, when you're doing hacking, you're in the VM. When you're not, you're not in the VM. And uh, that should hopefully, if you're careful enough, save you from doing things like posting as your LulzSec account without posting through Tor and stuff like that. You know, or what, what Rob just said, Mubix just said, you know, or you can just not do any leap shit. Uh, um, what fun is that? <laughs> What's the fun? Come on. So we, we won't jump any more, you know, too much into OPSEC, but what's interesting about this is he went beyond just saying, hey, keep your personal box safe, <coughs> separated. He went on and actually talked about something of the power of using a, attributable tools, you know, uh, tools yeah. that are publicly available, you know, hey, right. Metasploit uh, or you know, PowerShell Empire or, you know, the public tools that are available on a lot of the Cali distros might not be, you know, the most sexy. However... Right. You don't need to be the most sexy, you know. Um, you, you don't always have to have the most sophisticated tool to be able to get the job done. And this kind of, you know, illustrated that. On top of it, it's not like when you know people were tracking down Finn Fisher or the hacking team's tools and could say this is hacking team's toolkit because it was attributable. He used a publicly open source, non-attributable tools uh, that, you know, as far as we know, that this could have been, you know, it could have been Rob. You know, or right. any, any one of us to have access to Metasploit or Cali Distro. So I thought right. that was actually really sophisticated. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, before he posted this, uh, you know, I, I don't think anybody could have definitively said or with any real proof said, look, the guy who, you know, hacked uh, Gamma is the same guy who hacked Hacking Team because he didn't use the same executable. So that's where a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of hacking teams really kind of get done in is, is they say, well, we saw this binary used over here and this exact same binary was used to compromise this target. So therefore the people who did that are probably the same people, right? They reuse domain names, they reuse IP addresses, servers. What he's saying is don't do any of that. Um, one of the ways to make it easy is like you said, using publicly available tools like Metasploit. Metasploit could be anybody. You don't know who it is, right? If you write a custom thing um, and you don't rewrite it for the next time you, you know, hack somebody, then it's likely that somebody's going to be able to put the pieces together and say, okay, the person who did this was the same as the person who did that. No, I, I thought that was great. Um, you know, continuing on, I mean, it goes beyond just public tool attribution, which was sophisticated tradecraft. I mean, he kind of demonstrated here, it's not about the tools you use, it's about the techniques and how you apply them. So, and he was able to fly right under the radar uh, using these open source techniques. So it kind of shows and reiterates the power of some of these tools. I mean, if you're the practitioner who essentially explains, hey, I'm gonna conduct this audit and I'm going to emulate an adversary of a certain level of sophistication, I think this is a really good reference point to go back and say, hey, you know, hacking team, a team very familiar, very technical, you know, should have been able to catch maybe their own compromise. Right. They were compromised with these same public, you know, tools that we use to conduct our audits. I think that's a really interesting play and kind mm -hmm. of some of that to a customer as well. Yeah, no, it's a, it's a good point to make. I mean, and, and he said it, I think at least twice in there that look, hacking team is a company, a small company made up of basically computer security experts, you know, and, 
and as you read through the thing and read all the different ways, like he found passwords and he escalated and stuff like that, they made the same mistakes as everybody else made, even though they're computer security experts. You know, likely it's because they were spending more time developing their software than they were trying to uh, penetrate and test and secure their own network. But just because you're an expert in something doesn't mean that you're going to spend the time in the right place for the right things. So I, what's, what's interesting is what was just brought up in chat was, you know, um, Phineas did say he used a couple exploits. And uh, man, that's kind of a perfect way to kind of segue into our next category, which was the use of exploitation. Um, so he actually attributed and said, hey, you know what? I did my research. I took a look at the subnet, the IPs that were allocated to the hacking team. I realized mm -hmm. their public website was not exactly the same IP range as their private website or as their private IP range. Um, and then he was able to get down to the point that he said, all right, I know that these are my options. And unfortunately uh, for him, good for hacking team, his only way into the network that he concluded was the use of essentially a couple O day. And he had to kind of take a look and say, what O day am I going to use? What would be the most noticeable? Uh, maybe it aligned with his skill sets. And what was interesting is he decided that the, the way he was going to get into their network was actually through the embedded device. Um, and I thought that was actually really interesting. A lot of people go for web applications nowadays. Uh, but SQL kind of, and th this kind of points wide open that, hey, your embedded devices that you buy, maybe off Amazon, maybe they're pre-boned, uh, you know, actually matter. You, you need to be accountable right. when you're, you're running that old router. Um, the amount of O-Day, um, or not even O-Day, just, just bones that I see that are like, hey, I have found a technique that allows remote command injection on this embedded device are a dime a dozen. And although yeah. Phineas didn't say, you know, specifically what he used to be able to compromise this embedded device, he's kind of hand wavy a little bit and said, hey, I had to use an O-Day to get in. He did allude that once he was in, he was able to just author a backdoor firmware. And what's interesting right. about it is in the penetration testing red teaming world, I feel exploits get maybe thrown around a little too much. There, there's not mm -hmm. exactly equity management. And here's some of the tradecraft that I thought that uh, really set Phineas uh, apart from maybe some other hackers and kind of showed that his expertise was he's aware that you don't just throw an O-Day every single time to get back on the network. He was familiar that this O-Day was valuable, that it was going across the wire, I'm imagining potentially unencrypted. And it was valuable for him to not only throw this exploit and land it and make sure that he had some way to get back into this device so he didn't have to throw the exploit again, but he actually went through the time and did, you know, acknowledge that he did testing on the internet, kind of validating that his uh, exploit was not just solid on the device he was testing it on, but on other devices on the internet. Chris, yeah. you got a background in uh, finding more than one O-Day. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Do you think that's sophisticated? Yeah, I mean, that's that's definitely pretty good. <clears throat> I mean, because you never know, you know, if you a lot of times it's hard to fingerprint the exact version that's running on a device, right? You might know that it's a, you know, a type of device. You might know that it's a Cisco router. You might even know the model number, right? But you might not know like the minor version of like, say, Cisco iOS. What's the minor version of the software it's running, right? So if I if I think you're running uh, 4.6.3, but instead you're actually running you know, 4.6.5, when they recompiled their firmware, a lot of stuff might have changed that would make exploitation difficult. Addresses might be in different locations. Um, things that I, you know, registers that I say, okay, well, this register is going to contain this. Maybe it doesn't contain that. Basically, it brings the reliability of your exploit down. So what he's saying is, I don't want to burn this. Let me get on here once. Oh my gosh, it worked. I'm on. Now let me put a backdoor in so I don't have to ever throw that again. And, um, you know, then that benefits him in multiple ways, because one of the one of the best ways to get caught is to, you know, crash your device that never goes down. Right. If my network is always up, never has a problem, then all of a sudden today I'm like, why is my router rebooting? That's odd. You know, maybe I, maybe I log in because it's never rebooted in like two years. I log in. There's a crash. Dump. Oh, what's going on here? You know, then then I start looking into other things, other things that I might have like just disregarded as like, whatever, all oh, my network's being slow. Why is this file share slow? Uh, you know, whatever. I might've just disregarded this as nothing, but when I start to put the pieces together, like, wait, router rebooted, network is slow. Some dude logged into a box that he doesn't usually log into, like what's going on here? Then all of a sudden, you know, you're exposed. 
So I, I thought it was really neat. Um, you know, two of the comments, Chris, while we were chatting uh, that were brought up, Joe Vest yeah. uh, kind of explained like, hey, this this release really shows, uh, you know, just how much somebody's willing to go through and time to take uh, to take a penetration test or, you know, to the next level or actually compromise. And when somebody's dedicated and says they're going to get in, they're going mm -hmm. to find their way in. Um, it looked like Nick Roby wrote right above that as well, that uh, his decision to compromise the embedded device might have taken a significantly amount of more preparation than just the Joomla exploit. For instance, uh, you know, Phineas made mention that, hey, he, uh, he used BusyBox, or at least there was reference to BusyBox in there. You know, making mm -hmm. sure that when you compromise this embedded device, that it actually has your tool set needed to be able to take care of your automated tunneling and the port forwarding that actually goes on. Like, all of those are, are great examples of just how an attacker with enough time and capabilities is going to find their way in. They're going to do the research to make sure when they deliver that ODA or deliver that exploit that it's ready to enable them to, uh, you know, kind of expand their access. Yep. Yeah, it was, it was pretty interesting because this attack was not only um, Windows, but, you know, like uh, Movix pointed out, it started on Linux, on an embedded device. So, you know, he talks about how he had to, like, build several tools to run on this device. Um, you know, and compile them, cross compile them likely to run on probably ARM or MIPS device. And, um, you know, and then from there, he was able to run things like Nmap and uh, do port forwarding and stuff. Um, so in this case, like he had to have skills like on Windows and know about things like LSA dump and cache dump and PE dump. Um, but, you know, he also had to know how to do embedded Linux and cross compile tools and port forward and things like that. So it's kind of um, you know, whoever this guy is, he's got a pretty decent skill set. Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, the point here of, uh, you know, don't knock hacking team too much for uh, not noticing this. I will be first and foremost, I would have not owned, uh, or I would have not known that my, uh, you know, personal device at home uh, was Ponesert as well. You know, my access point that I have directly connected to the internet. So right. you know, I'm saying, you know, this could have worked against... An expert, I guess. I, uh, you know, sure. Breach detection. No, I, I, no. Right. I don't. I don't think. Um, I don't think the point was like, hey, look, they're experts. This shouldn't have happened to them. What I, I think the point was more is like, they're experts. They still miss the basics, right? Like a lot of the, a lot of people talk about, um, you know, don't try to stop APT. Don't try to stop the most ridiculous things. Start with the basics first. Get the basics down strong passwords, firewalls, um, you know, segmenting off your network, get the basics down before you're like, hmm, is this DLL a hijack DLL? You know, is this like, a, is this normal? Um, and I think the thing here was that they didn't really do the basics all that well. You know, like uh, there was one guy who on his share had a text file with a bunch of passwords in it, right? Like IT admins rail on this all the time. Like don't just put your passwords in a file called like passwords.txt. You know, so do we want to move to the lateral movement? I mean, we're, we're kind of talking a little bit about yeah. how initial access uh, happened. Um, yeah. What's interesting is we noticed multiple use of passwords. Uh, Phineas actually went through and said, hey, um, it was much more than just gaining the initial access. He had to do internal recon kind of get an idea of who was where, you know, what are the different members of the teams to the point he actually knew who the system administrator was. Um, and that allowed him to be able to do a certain thing. He knew who developers were that were committing certain things to the repo. Um, Chris, where, where do you want to go with this? Would we want to talk about just the use of passwords? I mean, there's more than enough people, right? Uh, you know, that, that here that have done password reuse, whether it's passing the hash. Um, Rob just called out, you know, hey, that that passwords.txt file was stored inside a TrueCrypt volume. Um, it's true, but if the TrueCrypt volume is mounted, then it's decrypted. I mean. I mean, it would it would save him from somebody stealing his hard drive and, and taking it away and then trying to power it up later. But you know, if you're logged into the box and I get on the box, your hard drive is decrypted, right? So I mean, yeah, they did. They definitely put it on an encrypted hard drive, which is a good thing. But don't have a passwords.txt unencrypted. Use like LastPass or like KeePass or something. I don't. I mean, I mean, I mean that's the thing. raise the bar a little bit. Let's go from like here to like up here. Uh, Password.txt uh, is dumb either way. Yeah, I agree, guys. Um, what was interesting, though, is he got in and good old-fashioned, uh, you know, Metasploit-like, 
loaded up either Kiwi or Mimi Cats and was able to get on the right boxes. So he took the time and uh, you know actually found the system administrator. And it reminds me of that Rob Joyce presentation he gave that said, "Hey, uh, I hunt system administrators." Mm -hmm. Yep. You know, um, Rob Joyce being the director of NSA's TAO, and I found that really interesting that this guy as well, he hunt the system administrator. So when he did pull down, you know, used Mimi Cats to pull the creds out of clear text, uh, you know, memory, that he was, he found the creds that he actually needed. It was, I believe, according to the story, if, if I'm not uh, mistaken, he used one of those creds to be able to get the true crit volume. Does anybody want to check me on this one since I don't have the actual pastebin article in front of me? Yeah. So, so what he did was, um, he found he found basically a backup, like there was a backups folder. He was able to mount the backups folder, and he found credentials for the BlackBerry Enterprise service. That's so, exactly basically, how they were running all their BlackBerry stuff. Um, once he had that, he was able to get local administrator. From there, he used PS Exec to start Metasploit, migrated to a sixty-four bit process, and then, like you said, I think he used Kiwi to. Uh, basically just dump all the local cached credentials, one of which happened to be domain administrator. Yep. So uh, Egypt uh, you know, made the point of just saying like, hey, uh, password manager, when, when somebody's actually on your box keystroke logging you, I mean, I guess the password manager itself would only go so far, but uh, you Good know, if, if people are hooking the browser to take a look at what you're submitting in those fields or anything like that, like you're pretty sure. much owned at this point when somebody's yeah. got you. Sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it's perfect. I'm saying raise the bar, make it a little bit harder. You know, okay. don't, don't, don't just put passwords.txt in like the root of your www share. Like that's a terrible idea. Not that they did that. I'm just, you know, as an example. Oh. Um, so, so yeah. The, um, but they also used some other stuff for lateral, um, lateral movement that was like just really kind of basic, like WMI, real common one. Scheduled tasks. Uh, what year is this? 1999? I'm crazy, right? Um, and then I don't think he used this one, although he did throw it out there. And I think a lot of people uh, like kind of overlooked this, but um, using global policy to run scripts at logon. Um, oh. So, you know, either setting a logon script if one doesn't exist or, you know, most of the time these logon scripts, like basically the first thing the script does is point to a script that's on the share and then run that, right? Like mount share, run script on share. So if you can just go to the share, modify that script, every time somebody logs in, now you're on that box, right? You just basically automated lateral movement. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you think about it, you probably don't often, uh, although there's multiple blogs for this that follow you know, the technical scene or the infosec scene, but I imagine most customers probably don't consider that they're you know, the same methods that are put in place to enable a system administrator to quickly move across network push patches could be used for information gathering. Right. Um, I, I know I wasn't clear, or it wasn't necessarily clear whether or not he actually used it. I know he mentioned to say like, hey, I could have, you know, right. what would a better way to use the system administrator tool to spy on all my people uh, right. or all, you know, all the targets within the network. Um, yes, sub T, you are correct. There was a heavy use of PowerShell um, there were, I saw some shout outs to uh, PowerShell Empire, to Harmjoy's blog, uh, also to our friend Craig, devttys zero. There was a couple shout outs to him in the uh, citations and stuff. So yeah, he was, a, he was a big fan of PowerShell, it looks like. So uh, moving beyond, you know, we just talked about lateral movement. I mean, in, in summary, when someone starts getting in, and if they're sophisticated enough to be able to do the recon, to get an idea of who your system administrator is, if they're able to use their current accesses to get to your system administrator, I mean, once they have those keys to the castle, you know, it's the chain game at that point. How can I chain the information that I gathered from here to enable this other access? And he ended up realizing, Phineas that is, that even though he had compromised, he had gained access to numerous backups that had emails, had you know, decrypted the true crypt. Uh, volume and actually found that passwords.txt. He knew he was missing the crown jewels, which was hacking team source code. And I, I found it really exciting on how he actually, you know, gained access to to there. Chris, do you, you want to talk at all about like the use of Nagios? Um, <coughs> um, yeah. So I mean, I don't know a whole lot about Nagios. I know it like monitors things, um, but I think he found the Nagios credentials in. Um, in that again, that login ht.txt file. Um, and then, you know, from logging in there, was able to 
uh, were the were the creds on Nagios, right? They were like in there so that it could like go and do uh, all its stuff. I'm I'm, I'm reading, excuse me, reading through some of the write up right now and just ask if anybody wants to jump in here and talk about abusing Nagios. I've used it in the past because usually Nagios needs you know admin credentials to be able to monitor. Or it doesn't need admin credentials. It needs creds to be able to monitor certain devices. And more often than not, than those, uh, you know, those actual, you know, creds tend to be privileged of some sort, uh, and kind of make it right for being able to expand access. So while I bring this up, uh, okay. So so what he said is he found he found basically the password to the web interface for Nagios in that text file, um, and then from there he used a public exploit to execute code as a shell, um, and then. It looks like, I think what he's trying to say is then from there, once he executed code in the shell, it was like unauthenticated, but then he was able to, again, use passwords from the text file to um, escalate on that shell. Gotcha. Any word with that, uh, the vuln that he used, the, the unauthenticated exploit that allowed him to land his shell, uh, was it patched? I mean, is this a, uh, not an argument why patching? Probably it is. It probably is. Let me... Nice. Yeah, he just dropped the, uh, looks like the uh, full disclosure link on that yep. unauthenticated uh, SQL injection. Yeah, I was just about to, I must have paid that too, but yeah. So, yeah, there you go. So, what better way to chain everything that, I mean, we could write a whole, you, know, you could write a whole class on what this guy has done. I mean, it's kind of a lot like, you know, the OSCE, OSCP type. How do you leverage mm -hmm. every access you can get? Um, this kind of guy just did it for real yeah. this time. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not like what you learn in your CEH. I'll, I'll, I'll throw OSCP out there. OSCP. Mm. Nice. So, with that said, um, you know, <laughs> we're you know, getting a, a tad off topic, but the point was this guy understood the network. He knew, I would argue, just as well as the system administrator. He knew where he needed to go. He was able to find the creds he needed, um, chain enough open source vulnerabilities, and when he needed to write his own ODA, to get initial access, spread laterally, find the data, and make off with it. Um, we've gone a little bit longer than we usually go on Tradecraft Tuesday, so I'll try to you know summarize it up. But two of the things that I thought were really interesting highlights for sophisticated Tradecraft that we kind of blew right past was his choice of what to exfil first. Like he actually show, uh, you know shared in here that when it came to exfilling this data, he was concerned that he could get caught, and he was talking about you know I imagine he. Some of his concerns were the slowness of the Tor network, um, you know, what he needed to be able to do to exfil this data out, and, you know, in order to continue his access later, um, making sure that he took the most important data first. That way, if he did get caught, you know, he still made away with enough. I thought that was really interesting. Um, on top of it, he actually set up in, I think it was thir yeah, 13.2, and this was persistence. He went a step further to say, hey, I didn't need to use a service, a run key or something else. And he specifically called out the Dooku 2 style persistence where he lived in memory on systems with high uptime. That way he could minimize his footprint of getting caught. And I think both of those show just how sophisticated this actor actually is. You know, although he might be this vigilante for good or for evil, whatever way you look at it, uh, he's a sharp guy and knew yeah. enough to the point that you know, he knew that he could get caught with persistence. He knew he could get caught with Xville and made very calculated decisions of how he would, you know, actually leave his footprint behind in networks. And I know that's something that we don't always take very serious when we conduct uh, penetration tests of, of the past or adversary emulation. So if we are going to move forward and we are going to help educate some of these customers that could be getting pwned this way, we should probably be following some of the same techniques that Phineas Fisher did as well making sure that we can show them this is what an adversary could do. He could not be in that run key. He could not be expelling you know, gigs out at a time. He could come in through this port redirection, but leave out another way as well. So so I think that leads right into uh, Mubix's question. Uh, number one, what do you think the vendors can take away from this? Like, What, what lessons learned are there? Uh, knowing your network, right? Know thyself, I think, right away. Uh, comes to mind. Uh, Rob mentioned earlier the importance of log correlation. I mean, logs, right? They grow unruly. You got to be able to know what to throw out, what not to throw out. There were telltale signs that someone was in this network. I mean, right. some of the users passed the hash. Um, 
you know, depending how he obfuscated those, you know, whether it was he just passing the hash to look like a, you know, an SMB client, I don't know. There, there's not enough to be able to derive, but I think this point, if anything I learned from this here was, you know, a sophisticated actor who wants in is going to get in and they don't need the sexiest toolkit. Yeah. He, you know, he might've used an O day to be able to get initial access, but his actions that he conducted within the network were very you know, rudimentary, but effective. Mm -hmm. You know, he mm -hmm. used a publicly disclosed vulnerability to kind of gain keys to the castle and let Nagio server. He targeted the system administrator's access. So, uh, you know, I'm a little bit at uh, you know, a loss other than, you know, the typical know thyself, understanding your network. I think this is really hard. I think hacking team got compromised and I don't necessarily fault them for their compromise, right? You know, I understand why it happened. I could see how they could not get, you know, not detect this. I see incidents that we respond to all the time that the actors are terribly noisy and they're doing all kinds of things. And for that circumstance, I would could, could maybe shame somebody. Yeah. But for hacking team, I, I think they, they met their, their maker on this one. They met somebody who was dedicated, who had the time, and I think it would have been hard to catch this. I mean, if anybody has questions, for instance, or you know, maybe comments, wants to join us, you know, this is the time that you guys can join us here. Click the call in button and actually share maybe some of your perspectives. You know, we've got open seats. It's open right now. Two more people who can jump in here. But I encourage anybody, especially if you have, uh, you know, feedback on like, hey, this is how I would have caught them or what could I do? I'll at least do my best to, to answer for you guys. Sure. All right. Looks like we got a caller here. Daniel Allen. Hey, Rick, I didn't forget about you on that. Uh, what are your uh, top three things you would write up on this uh, pen test report? I'm thinking about it. Uh, there, I Daniel? just I just say something silly. I, I actually wanted to point out, I I think this might be a girl. No one's really saying that. I've only seen a few people on, on Twitter yeah. say something, but I don't know quite... to say that. Well, just out of curiosity, not not saying I disagree, but just out of curiosity, what, what evidence would lead you to believe it was a girl? Uh, well, without giving up too much, I'm kind of old. It's just, it reminds me of someone from my past. I think, but the person that I'm thinking of is Portuguese, so I'm not sure. I just, I feel like, um, I don't, I don't want to say the political agenda is tipping me off on this, but it seems like I, 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 I sense the presence of a female in here. I think that it needs to be pointed out that it's quite possible that it could be. And I think it'd be a good, a good, uh, OPSEC would be good to, to sort of mask that in my male or my female, that would be a pretty good way to keep your, yourself out of the spotlight. Sure. Gotcha. Now, uh, my use of guy in this uh, is because guy is easier to yeah. say. Maybe it's I'm biased. But yeah, I, I actually, you know what? I would love if this was a, a female vigilante tearing up the internet. I, I think we could use more of uh, whether yeah. inspiration or, you know, awareness on that. But yeah, does it matter? Would be dope. Yeah, Frank, yeah I agree. It would be dope. Cool. Got anything else, Daniel, uh, of, of stuff that, you know, I appreciate you bringing it up. It absolutely could be you know, just a woman tearing yeah. up the hat. No, I think it's, this is fascinating. It's uh, it's it's definitely, uh, I, I hope what it does is it puts, uh, it sticks in the crawl of a lot of people that would intend on, I think where they really screwed up is the fact that they were caught and I'm not saying that they should have done it, but they got caught selling it to regimes that did, may or may not didn't deserve to have it. Um, and that's literally what, what brought this on them was that. And at being able, like for me, if I had my own, I don't even think if I had that company, I would have a website up. I think it would be backdoor deals between me and those governments, and I wouldn't want to have a public face at all. I think that's a big fail on their part that they, I mean, even when you look through their code and you see all the little jokes in there, the one about the CP inject, it just kind of gives like a, a sense of the culture that was in that company. And I think that's what did them in. Yeah. 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 All righty. Anybody else that have questions? Thanks again, Daniel, for joining us. No problem. Yep. Thanks for coming on. All right. This is the time then uh, if we don't have anybody else, and I'll give a couple more minutes for people to uh, ask questions. We'll go off the record in just a minute and actually uh, address anything that somebody didn't want to bring up, you know, on the recording itself. Yeah. Uh, you know, with that said, we do this every Tuesday uh, at noon 
I mean, there are some exceptions where, hey, we, we just can't get our act together. Uh, but yeah. keep an eye out we on the Twitter. You guys jobs know. And stuff. If you've got questions, comments, please hit us up on Twitter. It's easiest so we can put this stuff together. Um, and with that said, I think uh, I'm going to punch out uh, at least for um, you know this on the record session. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a good show. Thanks, uh, thanks, guys, for coming out and checking out. Hope to see you next week. All right. Later.